This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey everyone. So my guest this week is someone I worked with about seven years ago when I was working at Fossil. I was working on the Fossil.com website and she was in marketing at Fossil. And we didn't really work together directly very much, but she was just someone that was cool to talk to when I worked there. And I respected what she was doing, what her team was doing. And not everyone there was cool, to be honest. It had a good quote unquote culture, but not really a good practice of that culture. So it was nice to connect with her and just stop by her desk and chat and ask questions. And she would always answer them and really just was a kind person. And so that's why she's on the podcast now, because she's someone that I always kept kind of an eye on on LinkedIn to see what she was up to. And she's done some cool stuff since I left there. She's founded an art gallery and we're going to get into all that. So I can't wait for you to hear just what this person's done Jen C. Keaton because it's just awesome and it's so great to get to see what people you know and evolve into doing and then um, I'm privileged to have this podcast so I can discuss it with them here and share their story with others and if you're in Dallas that's where her gallery is so if you're ever there then you can go check it out and she even gave us an affiliate link for the podcast one of my first so that's awesome too Sometimes I like to try to share a takeaway at the top of the podcast when I stay focused and stay on message. (laughs) And in this case, I think the thing that resonated with me a lot from our conversation was just, we talked a little bit about doing things you enjoy just for the enjoyment of them, not because you're the best at them or not because you're going to then share on social media so everyone knows you did something or that you're going to try to sell, for example, if you're doing art or something like that but just doing something because you like doing it. And that's something actually that I have struggled with probably in the last few months, just with comedy, because I started doing comedy because I really wanted to do, do it and to try it. I mean, it wasn't to try to get a certain level of fame or anything like that. It was just, I need to go try this. And I had fun. And then at some point, because of comparing myself to others and because of, again, like maybe social media and, it showing all the good stuff about everything and everyone's good experiences and all their victories. I stopped enjoying it. I mean, I'm, I go and I do it a few nights a week and it takes a lot of time and it takes money. So I'm not making money at it certainly. Um, but I wasn't enjoying it. And so one thing I told myself this year is that every gig I do, I need to enjoy it. I need to have fun. And if nothing else happens, that's what I did is have fun. And it's been working. I mean, it's been a big practice. It's almost like a mindfulness practice I have to do now, but that's what I'm doing because it's so hard. If you compare yourself to other people who have been doing it for, you know, six months versus me three years and they're doing quote unquote better than me. Yeah. It's not going to be fun for me anymore because I'm going to be worried about what they're doing. But if I just worry about what I'm doing and set my objectives and my goals to do it and to have fun doing it, it's a lot better. And so I found that at the gym too. Um, You know, I'm not in the same shape as other people, but if I'm competing against myself and trying to get better for myself and better than the person I was last time I went, then it's easier because I, I know who I'm competing against and I know what they've been up to. I also know the truth. I don't think we know the truth about what everyone's going through just based on their social media accounts. In fact, I know that's true. Last year I did a show in the fringe festivals here. And it was really hard. And I posted something vulnerable one day and I said, Hey, this was a lot harder emotionally than I thought it would be. Come check out the show. It's going to be the last time I do it. And it was the last time I did it. I am going to do another show, an iteration of that one, but not the exact same one. And a person who I was working with wrote to me and said, Hey, I don't think you should have put that. It was emotionally difficult. That's not going to sell tickets. Well, first of all, it did sell tickets. But second of all, someone else was trying to regulate how I felt and regulate what I should post about that. And that really bothered me because I think telling someone else that they should be censored and expressing their feelings on something really isn't helpful because 
the truth was it was hard. And the truth is a few people did reach out after that and say that they knew because it was hard for them too. And I think it's just important to share those things. But also going back to what I was saying, it's also important just to do things because you like doing them and because you want to. And so if you want to paint, you're not a very good painter. It doesn't matter. Did you enjoy painting? Great. Uh, If I want to go cycling around the park, am I the fastest cyclist? No, people pass me all the time. But did I enjoy the cycling? Absolutely. And that's what's important. So, yeah, that's what I want you to take from it. Maybe maybe this week you'll do something you enjoy. Write a poem. Write a horrible haiku. I think horrible haiku should be a hashtag, shouldn't it? Because it sounds fun. Anyway, I will let you get to listening to the episode. And I hope you enjoy it. And I am recording this at 5 a.m. So if I sound a bit tired or sound like... It's the first thing I'm saying all day. It is. So that's why. Uh, Thanks again for listening. And, you know, share this, like, subscribe, review, everything. I would love that. And again, I always say it, but I'd love to hear from you. And I appreciate your time this week. Let's go. Hey, everyone. So this week, my guest is Jen C. Keaton. She's founder at Sweet Tooth Hotel. And we actually worked together a long time ago when I lived in Dallas and worked at Fossil together. So I'm really excited to be talking to her about what she's been up to. So thanks for being on, Jen C. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to see you again, even though it's virtually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where where are you at right now? Right now, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm in my house and we're getting ready for a big freeze. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. That's so yeah. it shouldn't be like the one last year that was really awful though, right? No, yeah. This is only gonna be like a quarter of an inch of drizzle, so all the roads will shut down for sure. Mm. I remember driving in Dallas during like a storm and realizing I'm not a good ice driver and I don't think anyone is. So No, no one's prepared. But we like it. We'll just be shut in our homes and yeah. do lots of creative things or just watch a bunch of uh T V. And eat more food. <laughs> and see, um, I remember one time seeing, just watching the news during one of those storms. And this car just kept trying to go up a ramp and sliding back down. And the news reporters were just basically laughing. And I was like, this is really good. That's basically like, Dallas. No one knows how to drive in any kind of weather. I'm surprised the cars aren't actually exploding on the highway when they touch <laughs> the so. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So first of all, let's just talk about what you're doing now. You're a founder at Sweet Tooth Hotel. What 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 are you really the founder of? Yeah, so Sweet Tooth Hotel, people always ask because it's obviously got the word hotel in the name. And we're actually an immersive art gallery. And I've been uh, running Sweet Tooth Hotel, this crazy circus, for four years now. So it's it's been a crazy journey because when you really think about it, running um, an art gallery in general and then Also, I went from digital marketing to in-person, you know, everything and made it through the pandemic, um, but still happening. So yeah, Sweet Tooth Hotel is basically a platform for local artists. And that's really how we started it is we had a lot of friends in Dallas. Uh, I say we, so my husband Cole and I uh, founded this together and we have a music background and a lot of my friends are artists and I was hearing them talk about how they couldn't get gallery shows because being in Texas, Mm -hmm. really what happens is if you are popular East coast, West coast, and you've had a lot of success there, then it's like, okay, Dallas is going to claim you. And they're like, Oh no, but they're really from Dallas. And we've always loved them, even though it's not been the case. So a lot of our friends couldn't um, find gallery shows locally And there wasn't an immersive art gallery in Dallas. Of course, there's a lot of great museums and contemporary galleries that that are definitely bringing, you know, immersive work. So Mm -hmm. we were really the first ones to work with local artists and present something that was a little bit more accessible to everybody. um, Because in our gallery, you can touch everything. Well, at the time when we opened, you could touch everything. (laughs) Is that a requirement too, basically? Or do people have pieces that you maybe don't touch or you don't interact with the same way? Yeah, originally, I think we weren't considering how many people were going to be touching something. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) so originally, everything was made to last a very short amount of time. Our first pop-up was only going to be 30 days. 
And we figured out, okay, everything is falling apart. And so every single day we were going in and like painting things and gluing things. Because if you think about it, if you have, you know, let's say a thousand people coming through and everybody's Mm -hmm. touching one spot over and over and over and over, even if it's metal, it's still, you know, going to have some wear over time. And what we also discovered is our guests really like to, I guess, do things that you tell them not to do. So mm. even though we say like, don't climb on this, don't sit on this, uh, on Instagram, we get tagged in all the photos. So we see everything that happens <laughs> behind the scenes because you're tagging us or your location tagging us or you're hashtagging us and we find mm-hmm. it all. So then, um, it becomes this very funny part of figuring out how to make art that is basically going to be climbed on, licked on, not licked on, but <laughs> touched it's all really high touch and we still try to stay true to the art form. So it's not like we're making industrial things like cars that are meant to have that wear and tear. So we definitely work Mm -hmm. with all of the artists now to figure out like, okay, there's going to be so many people coming through. How are they going to interact with your piece? And just long-term, you know, how, how are we also going to maintain it? Well, that's, I don't know. That's kind of interesting because I know I've actually, you know, in museums, I mean, you definitely, there are always ropes or something that stop you from getting too close or there's someone who's telling you. And I do think that's funny that people just tag you and almost like, Oh, look, I, yeah. I did this and probably innocently some of them. Did you hear about that Banksy land? I can't remember exactly what it was called now, but where basically it was a place you could go. That was a Banksy kind of thing. And the idea is that you don't stand in line. So people would stand in line because they think they should, but you could really cut in line and it wasn't a big deal. And they had kind of oh, created wow. this, yeah, like place where people, if they weren't following the rules, it was actually acceptable that people are so naturally like used to following rules. And uh, my friends that. would tell me about that. Yeah. Is it, kinda... Was it the one that was the actual Banksy verified? Because I know there was another one that popped up that was like Banksy, but they had pieces from him or her that um, were, I guess someone had purchased them and they were showing them. Yeah. So the place was called Dismal Land and you could basically just, I guess, break rules and it was okay. And I don't know. I think that would, for someone like me, I'm very much a rule follower. I don't know. I guess if the rules were to break them, I could do it. But if I didn't know that going in, there's no way. You know? look, looking at everybody like, they're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's, that's got to be an operational nightmare too. Can you imagine? Yeah. Like, they can do what they want. It's like, well, what am I here for? You know, I guess it's maybe an easy job, but so do you display any of your own art in the gallery or in the immersive place or no? That's a great question because when we started, we were working with a group called built by Bender. And so Cole and I were concepting and bringing, you know, overall concepts to them. And then we curate artists as well. But over the past four years, it's been the Sweet Tooth Hotel team. So it's uh, me, um, Noel Rodriguez, who has House of Noel, and he's a fashion designer. And so a lot of the work that you see in there, we'll take some of the rooms ourselves. And so they're Sweet Tooth Hotel rooms. While I don't always go under my own name and say like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm an artist and I made this, a lot of the things in there we're painting and making and sewing. And um, like we have one installation called Happy Place and we found out that there was a stuffed animal shortage happening. Oh, who knew? And so we decided, Oh, we're going to make our own stuffed animals. And so we made these smiling faces (laughs) and we made 300 hand cut, Mm -hmm. sewn them together and then um, actually printed on them, all the smiling faces by hand with paint. Wow. And so that's something that we are making a lot of the work that's going in there. Um, I've started doing a lot of painting like our current location there's icing drips that are coming down and so it was funny because I was like okay I guess I'm just going to paint these icing drips and it's like 30 feet across (laughs) like just a little bit you know Mm -hmm. but um, my mother is an art teacher and so I grew up learning these skills but then went into music so played piano and of course was in digital marketing and so they just haven't been skills that I've had to use in a while Mm. And so it was funny because even just using the brush to make like the circles for the drips, I was like, oh yeah, I can make a circle. You know? <laughs> so, it's been yeah. just rediscovering um, 
how to do a lot of these things. And it has made me think about what, what my work would look like outside of Sweet Tooth Hotel and hoping at some point I'll get time to pause and stop and actually work on some of that and just make things to make them and not make things to necessarily show people or have them for business or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But actually just for either you or for some other purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Just for fun. I think it's really hard for people now to make things just for fun because Mm -hmm. now it's like, what's my personal brand and how am I going to make money off this? Or, you know, it's going to turn into a big uh, business or something like that. And, And we lose that just making things to make them sometimes, Mm -hmm. which is so important. Yeah. There is that idea that even with the podcast, I mean, I'm not making money from it. And and a few people have said, well, how are you going to monetize it? And I mean, of course I would love to just get money for doing something I love doing, but it's also the point of me making it wasn't that. And I think that's hard for people to understand because it's like, even with everything, people put stuff on Etsy or they put stuff on, Facebook marketplace or wherever they put Mm it, you know, and then it's like the whole idea too, that are you good at something just because you're doing it doesn't mean you're good at it. Maybe you just enjoy it. And it's from being a kid, right? We're taught like to be good at something is important rather than just to enjoy doing things. Maybe. Yeah. There's still a sense of like um, doing what you're interested in. And I mean, I think when you're a kid, you are pushed into all these other like things that maybe you're not great at art and you're better at math or you're not great at math and you're better at art. And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately about just being able to slow down and also not having to share. I mean, definitely Mm -hmm. with social, it's just sharing all your work and putting the news out there and making sure not only you're sharing it, but it's like the best content, you know? Yeah. And so I like also seeing the shift with people sharing that it's not necessarily this polished, beautiful thing anymore that they're sharing kind of reality. Um, yeah. Cause I, I do think, you know, going through 2020, there's fatigue from everybody of just, okay, your life's not perfect. You know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I feel like I've, I've been sharing less on my account since we started sweet tooth because it's really been about, sharing everything that the artists are doing Mm -hmm. because a lot of these artists, they are creating simply to create and have shows and, you know, monetizing it is like secondary to everything that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's how hard is it to be an artist and, or to be any type of creative and to be making something, but also you're the accountant and you're the marketing manager. Mm -hmm. and You kind of have to, to do everything. And I think people talk a lot about that. uh, You don't get taught that when you're going to school, you know, to be a creative or to be an artist. Mm -mm. You don't get taught any of that for sure. So going and clearly you love that you're doing this now. I mean, this is something you're passionate about. How long were you thinking about doing this? I mean, when I met you, you were doing digital marketing, which now I'm doing, which is funny because that was definitely not my role. (laughs) And I know that's a hard job. I can say just having done it for a few months now, it's really difficult. How did you kind of, I guess, go from doing digital marketing to this business, which is partly that I'm sure, but a lot different and kind of how long were you thinking about doing it? The the crazy thing about Fossil is that there wasn't really an events team. Hmm. And so I was working on digital marketing and because Uh, my team was also managing influencer relationships. We started activating uh, with all of the media partners. Mm -hmm. And so Refinery29, um, their pop-up 29 rooms, who, in my opinion, was the first kind of mass, like mainstream art pop-up. And I'm trying to remember that word. Do you know that word where marketers are using it now, where it's like digital merges with a physical? Oh, it's called Um. (laughs) fidgetal. Oh my gosh. It's called digital. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> so now there's a new term. But I think that we were kind of those pioneers of that because all of a sudden you've got this social team and because we're covering social, we're, we're going and doing all of the events too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the events are all experiential. So 29 Rooms, Fossil had a room, and um, you probably remember it was Calling All Curious was the campaign. Mm -hmm. And there were these 
keyholes in the room. So you went in and you opened all the doors. But when I went up there, um, for some reason, they thought that the fossil brand was like grandma brand or something for some reason. So there was baby's breath everywhere. Oh my and goodness. It was like, and you know, baby's breath has that smell, like that old flower smell. I actually worked in floral. I worked at pro, proflowers.com for like oh, awesome. almost 10 years. <laughs> and I, that was one thing I hated was that stuff. And it wasn't used all the time, but I hated it when it was. So yes, I know that smell. It's yeah. It's terrible. It yeah. was so popular. And then I feel like it's not used <laughs> anymore. And it, but we got in and it was dried. It wasn't even like fresh. <laughs> So we started running all over the city trying to buy new stuff to put in the room because the the team, the Refinery29 team, they had a lot going on. And so they were like, you can't just like, you know, re- redesign your room right now. Um, so that was really the first one. And then uh, from there, I just really saw like that, that merge from the brand side of, oh, how cool, like these brains are activating. And so my marketing brain had always approached it from that end. And when I left Fossil, I somehow got into commercial real estate and was marketing doing all the marketing and commercial real estate and my ceo um the the company is called trademark property and he had a model of development called conscious place and he basically developed it after attending the conscious capitalism conference and worked with uh, the ceo of whole foods at the time And the model is basically that when you build a new place, you talk to everybody who lives in the community and you figure out what do they need? So do they need a green space? Do the Girl Scouts need somewhere to sell cookies, like a pavilion? And then you take all of that and then you develop it as a resource within the shopping center or the mixed use development. And so Victory Park is a neighborhood in Dallas Mm -hmm. that like it has the big arena. So all the big games happen, like the Mavericks play there all the big concerts happen. And that was one of the properties we were working on. So there was a space down at the end that was a construction office. And I went in and it was, it was going to be available. And I don't even know why I had started to get this idea of like, I should do one of these art pop-ups. But I think because I had just come from experiential and then I was in real estate and then all of a sudden I had access to all of this knowledge about what spaces were available and like how leases were structured I found this space and approached my CEO and was like, Hey, I really want to do this art pop up. And he loves public art. He loves art. So he was like, Oh, you got to do it. Like, it's going to be so cool. So the funny part is that a lot of people are like, Oh, so you did that funded by the real estate company. And it's like, no, somehow he just like, let me do this like side hustle thing. Nice. (laughs) And I signed a lease and Cole and I drained our savings account. Mm. And we were like, please, like, please, like, 200 people show up. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, 200 <laughs> people show up. We can just, like, make our money back. And the construction office had a window. So when you walked in, it was, like, a wall. And then it had a window cut out, kind of like an old-school motel or, like, by, by the hour, you mm-hmm. know, with those windows. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, oh, cool, this looks like a hotel. And there were already walls up because they had offices in there. And so I was like, what if this is like a hotel and then you check in, but then as you go into the rooms, it's all the art instead of like the hotel rooms. And I don't know. I just, I love like abandoned buildings and, Mm -hmm. you know, that nostalgia of like the roadside motel and the hotels. Mm -hmm. And so we, we went with that. And originally when we opened, we had Kendra Scott as a partner and we had, uh, yeah, Leatherology. And so when we announced it was like this massive explosion and tickets sold out in like literally like four days. Hmm. And so we were like, "Uh Oh, (laughs) (laughs) and it was only supposed to be open for 30 days. And we ended up extending it and then extending it. And then eventually had to close it because everything was not meant to last that long. Um, It still is art. And so it's still like a lot of it is very delicate. Like we have things that, um, you know, we have like neons in there and people were like touching mm. the neons and breaking the glass. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. I was like, why, <laughs> why would you touch that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we did learn a lot from that one and we ended up, there was an empty space next to us. And because that one was so popular, we were able to 
take the space next to us and expand. And then I was like, well, might as well add a bar. <laughs> Mm. So we went ahead and applied for a liquor license and added a bar to that location too. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really fun. I learned a lot of things that i never want to do again. <laughs> mm. yeah. um, but you know, that location we rotated for exhibits and the last exhibit we had there was called intangible and it was an all female fiber art installation. I had never really looked into all of the amazing facets of fiber art, but you know, every, every single uh, fiber art technique was in there from like crochet to pom poms to knitting to, you know, just anything you can think of latch hooking. And we partnered with an organization called craft yarn council and they, their main goal is to uh, promote yarn and fiber art and huh. um, fiber art is really beneficial for your mental health. And that was something during the pandemic, a lot of people picked up crocheting um, mm-hmm. and art in general is really great for your mental health. And so they helped uh, curate the artist. And that was our first installation that we brought national artists in. And we brought one of the biggest yarn bombers in the U S her name's London K. And um, she came in and do, did two big installations. Um, she's known for doing a lot of crochet. It's almost like crochet illustration and yarn bombing is a form of graffiti it's a form of street mm. art because essentially the artists are still going out to the street and they're placing it without permission, like on fences. Huh. And in New York, she was attaching these like yarn puddles coming out of mm. water pipes on the street. Wow. And so that was, that was really cool to, to work with these national artists and uh, craft yarn council, their partners donated uh, more than 2 million linear feet of yarn. Wow. So just, it was, I think it's something like 8,000 football fields of yarn, like back and forth. <laughs> God, that's so, um, so yeah, that was our last installation. And we're actually uh, just announcing that we're moving into a bigger space in the middle of downtown Dallas. Amazing. Well, congratulations on that. That's really cool. Thank you. So, and I guess long story short, then you, you moved out of your job in the, corporate yeah oh yeah or, i guess i yeah. skipped that part <laughs> no no that's part. fine no but that's putting my job part <laughs> no but that's that's great i mean i like i, I don't know this is uh oh, this is so cool because i didn't know this story so sometimes i'll i'll know the guest really well and so i'll know what they're gonna say but i had no idea so this mm-hmm. is really cool um so yeah so for you though can i is it safe to say that you were not unhappy in what you were doing in the first place or were you unhappy like when you made this yeah, transition. Yeah, that was the hard part. I really, I still love the company and I love my job and I love my team. And mm-hmm. so it wasn't really like I, I ever wanted to leave or wanted to do something else. It was just that this opportunity came up mm. and it was either, okay, let's just say, oh, this was a great success and that's the end of it. Or, okay, let's take a risk and really see where this is going to go. And I've always been a risk taker, so <laughs> um, it was hard to tell my my boss, you know, that I was leaving, and and I didn't really want to go, and I know he didn't really want me to leave either. Uh, but we both knew that this was really an industry that was starting to grow, and it's it's still very early, and it hasn't quite developed as much as as it would have if mm. in person like events and things wouldn't have all shut down. And so I think that you'll probably see, and I don't think it's going to be 2023. I think it's going to be 2024 where bigger brands and people with massive budgets are going to start to pick up again and invest in experiential. Mm-hmm. You have companies like Museum of Ice Cream and Color Factory that in Miawa, if I mean, they're, they're the biggest, they already had um, a lot of funding. And so people who already have this massive investment, it's like, you can't stop the machine you're still mm-hmm. expanding and opening all of your other locations and you're doing it safely, you know. And what was that one? Uh, which one? The What's the one that had that the bigger organization that you're saying? Meow Wolf. Oh, that yeah, one? yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. I think so, actually. Now that I've heard the name, yeah. Okay. So, so they started out in Santa Fe. Got and they it. were like this weird yes. little artist collective. Yeah. I've heard about that then. Yes, exactly. Santa mm-hmm. Fe. Okay, cool. Yeah. So now they have... Um, 
they opened this huge thing in Vegas called Omega Mart. Oh. And it's like a weird grocery store. And you can buy everything on the shelves. And so there's like weird things on the shelves. Uh, but then like if you open and you go through like the slushy machine or whatever, it's like different places, <laughs> you can go back into the art. And then there's um, a story of a girl who's missing. And so you can go through like her things and her room. Oh. And there were people who lived that were, so there's, there's always these crazy backstories with Meow Wolf that you could probably spend like all day in there if you really huh. wanted to, like trying to figure it out. And then Museum of Ice Cream, you know, I would call them the pioneers of the industry because they, they really were the first like truly like Instagram pop up. Mm-hmm. And so Sweet Tooth Hotel falls really in the middle of a Meow Wolf and a Museum of Ice Cream. Because everything we present is art. We're not an Instagram museum or like a selfie museum or anything like that. We present immersive art. And so hmm. you're going to go see art. Yeah, you can take photos and you can interact with it. But it's it's not a bunch of like photo backdrops or something like that. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So I guess if maybe how do how do the artists um, come to you? I mean, you I know you just said about the fabric art. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fiber art. That Fiber art. So... Like that was probably, I guess, an idea that you worked on with that organization. But do artists reach out to you or do do you just find them or how's that process? Yeah. So with uh, with our fiber art installation, Crafter and Council reached out. And this, this was always a funny story to me because Sarah, who works there, she sent an email and she was like, hey, you know, would you guys want to do like a fiber art installation? We could give you like a quilt or something, you know, something small. <laughs> And I was like, no, we're going to do the whole install fiber art. (laughs) So that was one that I'm, you know, I'm so thankful that she reached out. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of artists, and I hope anybody who's listening to this, if you are an artist, um, there's a lot of artists who reach out, but the artists who are really successful with being able to work with us and really with anybody in general, they they put a concept together before they Mm -hmm. reach out. And so we always try to find artists that either have concepts that they've been wanting to do, but they haven't had the resources or the space to do it. Or also um, we'll follow artists for a while. And so even though an artist is, is amazing and they're doing their own shows, it doesn't always mean that they're ready for an, a full scale installation mm-hmm. because that's a lot of work. Yeah, so finding artists, uh, it really has been a combination of, we've seen artists or artists reach out to us or organizations Mm -hmm. reach out to us. And I'm always going to different art fairs and shows. Um, And of course, Instagram is always a great way. A lot of the artists we work with, they have friends that are artists too. And so then they'll have group shows and we'll go see the group show. But we really look for artists that have a very distinct aesthetic. So they are making original work because there are a lot of contemporary artists and you might see them making more like pop art, and doing celebrity portraits and things like that. But all of our artists are, you know, they have a mission and a statement, you know, behind their work and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's been awesome because sometimes when the artists come in to do their installs, everybody starts collaborating. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, like someone's in someone else's room or we're in another room helping put together, um, Made by Mom is an artist that is in our current installation called Rewind. And she made 300 snails out of clay and painted them all, like 300, and they're tiny. And then she needed to put all the flowers inside of these snail shells. So there's flowers that stick out over the top of it and kind of cover the snails so they're like hidden. So I sat with her for a couple hours and just was like gluing flowers and snails for like hours and hours and hours. Um, But it's really fun. I mean, I think that anybody who's working a corporate job, you have the sense of like, I'm never finished. Yeah. And with art at some point, even though if you think it's not finished, you have to finish. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about creating and then, and then being like, okay, it's done. I'm not, picking it up. It's not continuing. It's on a never ending email or something like that. Um, that's, it's just been really awesome to participate in. And our goal is a lot of the artists we work with that, um, some of them are already fully, um, you know, they don't have a side job, like they're full-time artists. This is what they're doing. 
And some of them are really taking that step into becoming a full-time artist and they're trying to leave, you know, their corporate job or their day job or whatever that might be. And so this is a really good way for them to do that because not only do they get paid to create the installation, they also have this mass amount of visibility from everybody visiting. Hmm. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah, this is, this is great. And so I guess, one thing, though, like any job, I mean, even though this is something you, you know, founded with your husband and that, you know, something you want, want to be doing it's for you guys and for the artists, there's still like that whole idea of things becoming overwhelming or burnout or whatever. And so how have you kind of worked on or what are you doing outside of work maybe that is helping you with balance? Or even if you're not totally balanced, like, what do you try to do? (laughs) Because I know sometimes for me, depending on the week, if you ask me about balance, I'm going to have like a really not good answer for you, you know? (laughs) The hardest part is patience Mm. for me. That's one of my biggest challenges. And it's something that I've been trying to work on how to not rush and, and how to not take everything as an instant like failure if one little thing happens or like there's mm-hmm. a bump in the road. And a lot of that comes with experience because in industries that you may not be as familiar with, sometimes you run into things and to you, it seems like a really big deal. But then talking with you know other people who are helping mentor, they're like, don't worry about it. Like, you'll be fine. That's nothing, you yeah. know, because they've been through it. And it's like, yeah, it's it sucks, but you're going to make it through it, you know? It might increase your timeline or it might cost a little bit more, but you know, these are just things that happen lately. Um, so this is my 40th birthday year. Oh, crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I know I hit that two years ago and yeah, I know it, it, there's something with 40 though. And I think anyone listening to, and if you are 40 or over, you know this already, but if you're not, I thought it was like no big deal. Right. I'm like, "Ah, I don't care. No, no. Like right before on the dawn of it, it was like, I hated everything. I didn't want to party. I didn't want to. And my sister had the same thing happen to her. And she's like, oh, you were right. So how are you doing with it? Yeah, it's it's this thing where you're like, I'm going to turn 40. And then you're like, what? How am I 40? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> like in your, when you're in your 30s, you're still in that kind of phase where you're like, I'm 30, but everyone thinks I'm 20. When you're 40, you're just like, I'm actually 40. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I don't even want to pretend I'm in my 20s because I see yeah. people in their 20s and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm doing okay, but I think I, I think I have to pass into that phase of like, okay, yeah, I'm not shopping in the juniors department anymore. <laughs> that's not where I am. But I'm not shopping in like the, the Mrs. department. So no. I think there's still, I think society still has a little bit of a weird gap for women who are like 40 to 60, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it used to be like, oh, you're 30, you're done. And then it was like, oh, 30 is the new 20. And then I think people are trying to say like 40 is the new 30. And it's like, that is not. (laughs) (laughs) So Cole and I have been following a lot of David Sinclair's talks And David Sinclair is one of the medical leads at Harvard, and he's been doing a lot of research on aging. And it's like, aging, do we have to age? And there's chronologically aging, but then there's also biologically aging. And so internally, um, you have a... I'm not going to be able to say it right. But internally, (laughs) he had an analogy (laughs) where it's like, okay, imagine your cells are like a CD... And when you have a CD and it's really scratched up, you can't play it. But sometimes you can get some kind of like CD polish and you can polish the CD and you can get all the scratches mm-hmm. out of it and then you can play it again and you can read the data. So your cells essentially start breaking down and you have all of these scratches. And so they're not able to communicate data. And part of that data is also just like in repairing yourself and repairing your body. So he recommends NM. N, and I'm not giving any medical advice at all right now. <laughs> Let me say that up front. But essentially, it's uh, just things you can start taking that really start to help you supposedly, you know, biologically uh, not age. And so we've been taking that and we've been taking um, athletic greens. Oh, so like, yeah. You know, you take I all should... your vitamins and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're on a lot of my favorite podcasts advertised for them. Maybe I should tell them, hey, we've mentioned it now. Can we? (laughs) 
Yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, you should definitely. Athletic Greens. They, um, you know, you get everything first thing in the morning, and a lot of my friends they laugh because at the end of the day or in the morning you have your pill case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are you like? <laughs> yeah. Clack, 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 clack. Like all your yep. pills. <laughs> um, but but with this, like you can kind of get everything at one time. Yeah. And so, we we've been trying to do those things, and I've had a lot of friends that when they hit forty, they quit drinking. And that was one thing I was like, I don't know if I can quit drinking like <laughs> ever, but yeah. you know, then it, then it's kind of this thing where it's like, I don't know, maybe you've reached an age where your, inv- your new investment is in your health and in your body because you had that luxury when you were younger, just kind of like throw everything away for a little while. Yeah. Um, so I think that's my journey. I'm resisting it uh, mm-hmm. very, very much, but <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. It's the yeah the whole 40 thing and when people like people will tell me oh you don't look for you look young you look like younger you look like in your mid-30s and it's like well that's not young is it you know what I mean <laughs> first of all you're lying I know what I look like but second of all it's like you haven't really taken much time off of it you know that's like if someone's 65 oh you don't look that you look 60 well that's kind of like yeah. who cares you know yeah so. and you're like <laughs> why does it I don't know. And then it's funny because it's like, so what are you saying? Is 40 old? Like, oh, I don't look yeah. old. Like, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like, yeah. I think anything with age, you're always like, okay. But my grandma was one of those people that just, you know, up and through her 90s, she acted like a 12 year old. You know, she was yeah. always happy and always had so much joy. And so I think, you know, mentally, it's just as important to be in a good headspace. Mm-hmm. Cause a lot, you know, you see a lot of people like they start to get really negative as they get yeah. older. And so I think just staying positive and me learning patience. <laughs> yeah. Those are big. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so are you doing anything? You mentioned that you were in, in music and I think you do have a project right now. So you can talk, talk a little bit about your music and your career with music. Yeah. So my old band, I toured for, uh, three years full time. And we were a band for seven years and we did some pretty big U S tours. I think my favorite tour was with a band called metric and they're a Canadian band, but they have some New York members and they had been a band forever. And they released an album called fantasies and it was a hit because it was on the radio and they were like, we've never been on the radio. So they were playing sold out all across the U S and into Canada. And we were on their tour for a little while. And then when I got married, I was not in that band anymore because that band was with my ex and we oh. started the band <laughs> and then we broke up <laughs> while we were in the band, we broke up and then we got signed so that we had to stay in the band. Oh man. It was like a whole thing. So, um, so I started writing music at home and I really, my old band was kind of folk pop. And so I really wanted to work on something that was a little bit more electronic and Cole is a drummer Okay. And so that really helped because he was able to help craft all the beats and I play piano and sing. And so I was writing a lot of the songs on piano and then adding all the instruments digitally. So mm. strings and um, every, anything symphonic, you know, now you can replicate digitally. And unfortunately it sounds the same most time yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, for better, or for worse. And so we really, we started working on that and it, it became really fun and like a passion project for us. And we named that band for 75 and we have a producer that we met. He's a DJ and he goes by left, right as his DJ name. I don't know if that's cool to say my DJ name or whatever, but <laughs> his DJ name, left, right. And then he has another project called us. We them. That's really more geared towards uh, composing like for commercials and short films and scores and things like that. And so because he is of the background where he was classically trained and knows music composition, but then also he knows like what's going to drop, like be hot in a club. He was great to work with, with us really being songwriters, but at the end of the day, wanting like this kind of bigger electronic sound. So we, we started down that path and we were playing a lot of shows, releasing music. And then when Sweet Tooth Hotel started, it was like that took over everything. And that was kind of the creative outlet. But now we're, we're looking at getting back into music because part of what 
French 75 was really doing. It was that creative outlet where we would make music videos to go with the songs. Mm. And a lot of those music videos, we, then we would make like the sequel to that video. And so we were releasing all these different pieces and parts. And so that was really a creative outlet where for me, it was like, even if we're not playing shows, we're making music videos and we're being creative. And with music, I've talked with a lot of musicians about this. It's sometimes it's hard to write if you are happy because Mm -hmm. a lot of this kind of commentary and angst is coming from, I mean, it's like age old, you know, heartbreak or loss. And so I think pop songs can come from really happy places, but for some people, like it is hard to create if you don't have like Mm -hmm. conflict or angst in your life. So I've been trying to get back into it, but I think it's one of those things where it's like, what do I have to say? What do I want to say? Yeah. Um, but but yeah, we have music up on like Spotify and we have stuff on YouTube. So people can go listen to it. We also have a full remix album. So we released the regular album and then our friend Dylan, he goes by Mouthbold. And then he re- released a remix at the same time. So it's cool to have both versions of the songs because when we were playing live, we would play the regular version and then we would go into the remixes. Mm. And and also it helped because it made our set longer so we could actually play for like an hour instead of like 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I really love all that music and um, music is cool because you can, you can tie it to some part of your life and really know like, what was I doing then? Mm. Um, it just instantly like put you back in that place um so a lot of good memories nice that's awesome so it's good that you're able to keep the music going but also do this the art now so I know that you've set up a affiliate link for this podcast so I'll be posting and talking about Sweet Tooth Hotel but can you talk a little bit more about the big news you had today about your downtown uh, location yes This is really the craziest thing ever, and we're so excited about it. We have a space in the middle of downtown. It's on Elm Street. So for anyone who's familiar with Dallas, I mean, it's right in the heart of downtown. It's down the street from the Majestic Theater, which is this historic, beautiful um, venue. And we just announced our cocktail lounge partner, too. It's uh, Cali Rosa Tequila. And Cali Rosa is founded by Adam Levine and Bahati Prince Lou. Um, and they are the entire lounge sponsor. So they have a tequila that's pink because it's aged in red wine barrels. Um, wow. And so it turns the tequila pink and it's really cool. They have an Añejo. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll be opening sometime in 2022. We'll have nine art gallery spaces, a gift shop. Our gift shop, we always rotate out local brands and artists. Um, and so that's always available to have pop-ups. So there's still a component to the pop-up. Um, but the biggest thing is we have a 10 year lease. Wow. So talking about age, I was like, I'll be 50. <laughs> yeah. Our lease is over. Wow. Um, but we really are invested in, you know, the art community and the creative community and we're invested in downtown. They've been awesome to work with. So yeah, that's big news that just happened today. That's, that's really great. That's exciting. And that means that I will eventually be able to come there too and visit. So that's good. Yes. If you come back to Dallas in sometime in the next 10 years. (laughs) Yeah, I'll be, (laughs) we'll be there. (laughs) Good. Well, that's good. So doesn't mean people should wait 10 years to do something, but yeah. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Cool. All right. Well, do you have any advice or mantra that you like to share with other people? I think the biggest advice that was given to me and that I followed throughout my career is to really do the work that you want to be doing. And I heard people all the time say, I quit my job and I did this. And it's very easy for them to sit there successful and and give that advice. However, if there is something that you love to do and you want to take that risk, then just do it now. Because if, that's the work that you're putting out there, then that's the work that people are going to engage you for and hire you for. Um, and so I say, just don't wait because life is really short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's one thing that this podcast is meant to do is to encourage people to try the thing, do the thing, whatever it is, however they can, you know? So yeah, that's awesome. 
So I have a set of questions called the Fun Five, and they're just five questions I ask everybody. The first one, what's the oldest T-shirt you have and still wear? My dad has all these concert T-shirts. And so I have one, and it's one of those baseball tees with, like, mm-hmm. the dark arms and the white, and it's a Doobie Brothers concert T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what the Doobie Brothers sing, but I You don't? It. Oh, it's Michael know. McDonald. <laughs> yeah, look, you have to know. <laughs> I should really know that. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, that's cool. That's good. Um all right. And if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like it kind of felt, especially when during the lockdown part of the pandemic, what song would you have your alarm set to play every morning? I've always really loved the movie The Royal Tenenbaums. And oh, yeah. there's a song Stephanie says, and I believe it's by the Velvet Underground, but it has a line um, that says, she's not afraid to die. Her friends all call her Alaska. And, like, I just love that line. I love that song. Um, it's just a really, like, mellow, chill, sweet song. Um, cool. So I think it would be that one. Side note, right. it actually is Groundhog's Day today. It is. You're right. It's <laughs> February 2nd when we're recording this, and this will come out probably in March. But, yeah, yeah. it's Groundhog's Day. So shout out to uh, Bill Murray, really, I guess. Right. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Always always get to mention Bill Murray. Uh, all right. Uh, coffee or tea or neither? Both coffee in the morning and then uh, matcha latte in the afternoon. <laughs> nice. And do you take your coffee in any certain way? I always make it in a French press and then oat milk for the coffee. We have a frother, so, nice. and then cinnamon on top. Uh, cinnamon is my sugar replacement. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Cool. All right. And can you think of something that just makes you? laugh every time you think of it or has made you laugh so hard you cry recently kind of that you can talk about on a podcast so this is it's funny to me because you have to know my dad so my dad is from thailand and we took him to go visit his family and he's like pretty stern dad and i always think about this moment because we stayed in a hotel room and we bought all these weird like korean face masks (laughs) and apparently I don't know what happens in Thailand, but apparently my dad engaged in some recreational drugs and came back <laughs> to the hotel and then we put these face masks on him <laughs> and he, we have video of him like walking around the hotel and he's like very dark in this like white face mask <laughs> and he's just like making fun of everybody. <laughs> so um, I'll have to send you the video because he's just like cracking himself up and it's like me and my husband and my brother and we're all just like watching him like going crazy with the face mask on. <laughs> Great. That's good. Yeah. That sounds fun. Um, All right. Awesome. And then the last question, who inspires you right now? You know, um, my, I was like, I guess this is not cliche, but maybe cliche, but not cliche, but my husband Cole and I work a lot together on all kinds of projects. And so he just started a new career and it's something that um, an industry he hasn't been in. And they just had a, like an ad or a billboard go up on the NASDAQ tower in the middle of New York. And so he's working on this new brand. It's called Lacework. And so it's been really inspiring to watch him on his journey. It's a little bit um, of a like split from mine. He's really, mm-hmm. you know, going into some big industries and things like that. But I think just having a partner in general, whether it's, you know, a family member, a husband or a friend or whatever, it's important to find somebody who inspires you that you can work with on a day to day. Mm -hmm. So that for me, like he's always been an inspiration and kind of lifting me up when I don't have patience. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I like that. It's not that I don't think it's cliche. I mean, people, yeah, will feel weird. I think when they say someone in their life, they admire, but I think it's kind of nice to be able to surround ourselves with people we do admire, you know? Yeah. Um, And people that can, you know, be mentors and be inspirations. Um, I think a lot of people started to really look at like who their friends are and who they're hanging out with when they stop to slow down um, Mm -hmm. 2020, 2021. And I know I've had a lot of friends be like, Oh, I cut them out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And form better relationships and healthier relationships. So Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So if people want to find you, where should they go? They can go to sweettoothhotel.com. And luckily having a unique name like that, all of our social handles are at Sweet Tooth Hotel. And 
personally, I also have a really uh, unique name. So you can go to at Gen C, J-E-N-C-E-Y and find me on social channels too. Cool. Awesome. Well, Gen C, this has been great. It's really nice to see you, talk to you and just hear about what you've been up to. This is awesome. So congratulations too on the downtown Dallas location. Yeah. I'm so happy to see you too. And I love that you're in London. I'm imagining like you're really cosmopolitan and walking around and like doing cool things. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes I am. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at, at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok. And the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.